Okay, tonight is Alma chapter 30. Behold, now it came to pass that after the people of Ammon were established in the land of Jershon, yea, and also after the Lamanites were driven out of the land, and their dead were buried by the people of the land, that their dead were not numbered because of the greatness of their numbers, neither were the dead of the Nephites numbered. But it came to pass after they had buried their dead, and also after the days of fasting and mourning and prayer, and it was in the sixteenth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi, there began to be continual peace throughout all the land. Yea, and the people did observe to keep the commandments of the Lord, and they were strict in observing the ordinances of God, according to the law of Moses, for they were taught to keep the law of Moses until it should be fulfilled. And thus the people did have no disturbance in all the sixteenth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. Right, so it's uh, transitioning for you here in the first uh, couple of verses, talking about, okay, the, the, now the people of Ammon are in place in the land of, of Jershon, the, the war is done, they're burying their, their dead, it's, it's too many to even count how many were uh, killed on each side and mourning them. All right, so this, this is how the, uh, the previous chapters have wrapped up now, and so it's just kind of setting the scene for you here in the 16th year of the reign of the judges, this is what, what was happening, right? So other than all the cleanup, it says the 16th year was a relatively peaceful, calm year, and uh, so it was a good transition from the, the first 15 years, which had a lot of different things going on. Okay, now, when it mentions the people of, of Ammon, right, what, uh, what, what other names have the, the people of Ammon have gone by? It's the people of Anti-Nephi-Lehi, right? If you remember, they, and, uh, and what uh, race were, were they? They were the, the, the Lamanite people, okay? And uh, the ones who were, and how were they distinguished from the other Lamanite people? Because they were the ones who were converted, right? Okay, they were the ones that did. The four sons of Mosiah you know, reached out to them, and so uh, Ammon was kind of the lead uh, in that. So that's why they then took the name of the people of Ammon, and they and they left the, the land of the Lamanites, as I said at the beginning, and they came over to the near the land of Zarahemla, where the Nephites lived. They gave them their own land, the land of Jershon. So that's that's who they are. Okay? And it came to pass in the seventeenth year of the reign of the judges, there was continual peace. But it came to pass in the latter end of the seventeenth year there came a man into the land of Zarahemla, and he was Antichrist. For he began to preach unto the people against the prophecies which had been spoken by the prophets concerning the coming of Christ. Now there was no law against a man's belief, for it was strictly contrary to the commands of God that there should be a law which should bring men onto unequal grounds. For thus saith the scripture, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. So here's a little bit of what's happening in the 17th year. It says hey, this, this new person comes on the on the scene. He was antichrist. The right? idea was that he, he didn't believe in Christ, and he was telling others to uh, to not believe also. So again, it's one thing to not believe yourself, but then another thing to try to convince others not to believe. So that's why he was referring to him as a, as, a, as an antichrist. Right? So he began to preach the people against the prophecies and so forth. Right? And now in, in in seven, it's starting to say that all right, that you know this guy was basically a, a nuisance and. Uh, you know, the, the, a lot of people didn't care for what he was doing, yet there was no law against it, so I guess they, they couldn't uh, arrest him or they couldn't force him to, to stop, but uh, so it was just being a, a nuisance with this, and uh, so it was a concern of, of theirs, right, that they had no, I guess, legal recourse. Uh, that says, you know, you can't legislate a man's beliefs, and uh, so he can believe how he wants, and so they were just trying to look for a way to, to stop this, but yet they, they couldn't do it on any legal grounds. You know, in, in verse 8 it says, uh, For thus saith the scripture, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. Okay, who, whose uh, statement is that? Joshua, okay, if you remember from the, the, the book of Joshua. Now if a man desired to serve God, it was his privilege, or rather if he believed in God, it was his privilege to serve him. But if he did not believe in him, there was no law to punish him. But if he murdered, he was punished unto death. And if he robbed, he was also punished. And if he stole, he was also punished. And if he committed adultery, he was also punished. Yea, for all this wickedness they were punished, for there was a law that men should be judged according to their crimes. Nevertheless, there was no law against a man's belief. Therefore, a man was punished only for the crimes which he had done. Therefore, all men were on equal grounds. I, uh, I kind of like how verse 9 is, is worded in your hand, if you, if you saw that. It says, it starts out saying, if a man desired to serve God, it was his privilege. Then it says, well, well actually, let, let, let's, let's rephrase that. If he be believes in, in God, then, then it's, his, it's his privilege to serve him. And then certainly we appreciate what he's done for us, and so it's our privilege to, to try to serve him. And so 10 saying, for all the other things, he could be punished, right? And uh, 
but it does, there's no punishment for the person's beliefs, but, you know, if he wants to kill or steal or rob or whatever, you know, right, there's punishments for all those things, but still everybody's open to their own beliefs. And so, the, so in 11, as it sums that up, see, now it explains the part about, you know, when I was first reading it, I, at the end of verse 7, it said that it, it was going to bring, it didn't want to put men on, on unequal grounds, and I wasn't really sure what, what that was getting at, right? But now in 11, it kind of clears that up, right? In 11, it says, the, the idea that people just punish for what they do, not for what they think, right? And so, not what they believe. So, all right, so yes, if you, if you do something, you get punished, and that's anybody, no matter what your belief is. So, that, that's what I meant by putting everybody on equal grounds is that you weren't punished for what you think, you are actually punished for what, what you do, right? And so, and that can then be the same for everybody. So, they're trying to judge what, what somebody believes, or if, if what you believe is different than what I believe, so therefore I'm gonna, not going to allow it. So, this way, everybody was on equal footing there. And this Antichrist, whose name was Corihor, and the law could have no hold upon him, began to preach unto the people that there should be no Christ. And after this manner did he preach, saying, O ye that are bound down under a foolish and a vain hope, why do ye yoke yourselves with such foolish things? Why do ye look for a Christ? For no man can know of anything which is to come. Behold, these things which ye call prophecies, which ye say are handed down by holy prophets, behold, they are foolish traditions of your fathers. How do ye know of their surety? Behold, ye cannot know of things which we do not see, therefore ye cannot know that there shall be a Christ. Okay, so now we uh, find out the Antichrist name okay, in this chapter, which is Cory Hort, right, this particular person that they're referring to. And, um, and it's again, just reinforcing the fact that it says the, the, the law couldn't do anything about him, right, because he wasn't breaking the law per se, he was just preaching things that were contrary to the beliefs of a lot of people, but not killing or stealing or anything like that. Okay, so, and then now it shows you some of the things that he's saying, right? And, and so as you read the 13 to 15, as we just did, um, you, know, you see some of the ways he's trying to convince people that there should be no Christ. And, you know, if, if you want to go down this kind of path, you know, and sometimes we see people who are, I'll say, disgruntled uh, former believers, all right, that, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can always try to come up with a negative, a negative way of spinning something, Right? Because especially if we're, we're in a faith-based business here, okay, a lot of what we do is based on faith. You know, it, it's, some of the things of God can't be proven you know, absolutely because it requires faith to, to believe it. And so if you want to poke holes in somebody's faith, you can always do that. Right? You, you pick on, uh, you know, if, if you're going to do it today, you, you pick on one uh, unanswered prayer and say, oh, where's your God now? Right? You know, how come this happened if, if you're... You know, if, God's there. I mean, why, doesn't God love you? I mean, why, why didn't He answer your prayer? Why did He let you get sick or die or lose your job, or whatever? You know, you, so you can you, you could go down that path if you want to, right? But the, but if you want to have faith, then you put things in God's hands and you trust that God is is in the matter, and that you know at some point we would understand how why things worked out the way that, that they did, right? But you can see where somebody trying to be negative about it can just pick on the negative parts and then try to dissuade you, right? And and sometimes, unfortunately, people, they hear enough of that, is, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah, you know, and then it can really start to weigh on, on you after a while, right? So that, that, that's the kind of stuff that I get from here, right? So, you know, how, well, why are you looking for Christ? How, how can anybody really know what's coming? You know, what they, yeah, they, they just say, you know, it's coming, but then, you know, how, 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 how you know what's going to happen in the future? It's just has been passed down through, through, the, through the ages. They're just repeating what their fathers and grandfathers said. They, they don't really know. So what, what are you going to believe them for? Do you, do you see any evidence? Where's, where's this Christ? I don't see any Christ. You know, so, that kind of stuff. So. You look forward and say that you see a remission of your sins, but behold, it is the effect of a frenzied mind, and this derangement of your minds comes because of the traditions of your fathers, which lead you away into a belief of things which are not so. And many more such things did he say unto them, telling them that there could be no atonement made for the sins of men, but every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature. Therefore every man prospered according to his genius, and that every man conquered according to his strength, and whatsoever a man did was no crime. And thus did he preach unto them, leading away the hearts of many, causing them to lift up their heads in their wickedness, yea, leading away many women, and also men, to commit whoredoms, telling them that when a man was dead, that was the end thereof. And you can see the undermining of uh, you know many beliefs that we hold uh, dear today, right? It's being contradicted here, right? And uh, and, and notice some of the the uh, phraseology, right? It's the effect of a frenzied mind, and this uh, and the, the derangement of your minds comes because of the traditions of your fathers. So you're you're de de deranged and uh, and frenzied, right? If you believe in this kind of stuff, 
right? So it's, you know, it's actually it's you know, trying to be insulting too. And, you know, it's like, it, it would, yeah, it'd be crazy to believe in the, the, this kind of stuff. In 17 and in 18, right? It's uh, um, talking against a certain belief, like I said, that we uh, that we hold dear today, and one idea that we would have a, an eternal soul that that would that could be saved in the in the kingdom of heaven, right? Is he talking against that? Be talking against the uh, the concept of a, a resurrection. Right, or, or any atonement for sin, right, which is all the things that Christ does for us. Right? So he's saying it's, it's no such thing. Is what he's saying. When, when you die, you die. Right? So you, you live in this life, and when you're done, you're done. There's, there's no, nothing further, nothing beyond this life. So again, almost sounding like, to me, almost like really not even a belief in God, but certainly not a belief in, a belief in Christ as a Redeemer that would allow us to, the chance to, to live on beyond this life. Don't worry about that, you know, God's Giving you the strength to do this or that, it's it's all up to you. You know, if you do well, it's because you're it's, it's your own skill. It says do your own your own genius, your own strengths, and so forth. So you what you accomplish is up to you. It's not worry talking about some God's going to help you. You just do what you can for yourself. You you're going to enjoy life based on what you do, and then when it's done, then then you're done. All right. So basically, is if you take God out of the equation, that's the kind of life that the, the, the people would live. Now this man went over to the land of Jershon also, to preach these things among the people of Ammon, who were once the people of the Lamanites. But behold, they were more wise than many of the Nephites, for they took him, and bound him, and carried him before Ammon, who was a high priest over that people. And it came to pass that he caused that he should be carried out of the land. And he came over into the land of Gideon, and began to preach unto them also. And here he did not have much success, for he was taken, and bound, and carried before the high priest, and also the chief judge over the land. Showing that he's moving around from uh, area to area here. It uh, says he went to the, the land of, of Jershon, which we just referenced at the beginning of the chapter, where the, the converted Lamanites live, otherwise known as the people of Ammon. Right? So he tried giving them that story about uh, you know, it's not going to be any Christ and so forth. Now, you know, if you think about it, these, these people were the most recently converted. Right? So it almost could go either way, right? You could, they, if they were like, you know, new and frail and shallow in the faith, perhaps they could be persuaded, but, but in fact, that they weren't that at all. Right? If you remember from the chapters that we read, they were so deeply rooted in, in their belief that they buried their weapons, right? That they, they wouldn't even pick up weapons. They'd kill me before I, I, I go pick up a weapon, right? That they believed that much in God. So they, they knew where their soul was going when they left this life. So, they, so can, now, imagine that strong of a belief and, and some joker coming in saying, oh, yeah, come on, there's, 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 there's no soul, you know, you're not going to anywhere, right? It's, it's, so, so what does it say that they did? It says they were, they were more wise than the Nephites. They, they took them and bound them and, and brought them to Ammon and said, do, do something with this guy, right? You know, he's just being a, a, a nuisance here, right? And so notice it says that they, 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 they carried him out of, the, out of the, the, the city, right? And then he went over to try it some, somewhere else in, in the land of, of Gideon, right? But uh, it says he didn't have much better success there. It says they... They, they took him bound to the high priest and said, do something with this guy. It was good to see the people were, were not affected by that, right? So again, it's one thing to, to preach uh, things that are contrary to your belief, but it's another thing is if now people are starting to believe it, then that's even a, a, a bigger problem. So. And it came to pass that the high priest said unto him, Why do you go about perverting the ways of the Lord? Why do you teach this people that there shall be no Christ to interrupt their rejoicings? Why do you speak against all the prophecies of the holy prophets? Now the high priest's name was Gedona, and Corihor said unto him, Behold, I do not teach the foolish traditions of your fathers, and because I do not teach this people to bind themselves down under the foolish ordinances and performances which were laid down by ancient priests, to usurp power and authority over them, to keep them in ignorance, that they may, may not lift up their heads, but be brought down according to thy words. So as he's brought before the, the high priest here, as the high priest's name was uh, Gedona, and uh, so he's questioning him. He says, why, why are you doing this? All right? why, why are you doing this? You know, these, these people believe in, in Christ, and, and they're, they're happy and joyful. And I mean, what, what's your problem here? What are you trying to do? Bring everybody down? All right? they're, they're pumped up by their belief, and now you're just going around telling them, no, don't, don't believe that. His, uh, his answer there, all right, which is consistent with some of the stuff he's already been saying, I don't believe the false traditions and ordinances and so forth, and so I, I don't believe it. And so... Yeah, I, I don't want anybody else to believe it either, basically. Ye say that this people is a free people. Behold, I say they are in bondage. Ye say that those ancient prophecies are true. Behold, I say that ye do not know that they are true. 
ye say that this people is a guilty and a fallen people because of the transgression of a parent. Behold, I say that a child is not guilty because of its parents. And ye also say that Christ shall come. But behold, I say that ye do not know that there shall be a Christ. And ye say also that he shall be slain for the sins of the world. So you can see he's presenting really an argument here. You know, you, you say this, but I say this. Okay, or, or I don't believe what you're, what you're saying. Right? It says, you know, you, you say the people are free people. I say that, that, that they're not. Right? You say the prophets are true. I say that, that, that they're not. Right? Now when it says that uh, in 25, that the, uh, you say the people are guilty because of the transgression of a parent, or I say the child is not guilty because of his parents. What are you referring to the first parents? And it, uh, you know, because, of course, that's, that's why Christ had to come, because the, of the transgression of the first parents, which were then passed down all the way through the, the generations. So the original sin, of course, is taken away in Christ, all right? But, uh, so that's, that's our belief. So in trying to contradict the idea of Christ, he's saying, you know, he's saying, well, the, 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 that makes no sense to me that, the, that I should be responsible for what somebody else did in the, in the past. Now, I mean, in general, that, that's true, all right? But that, that's why God set in motion the plan of salvation, that we wouldn't have to be, if you will, punished for what Adam and Eve did or anybody in our past, rather than you, you're saved of your own right. So that, that's why Jesus came. So but yet, you twist it a little bit and say, oh, that, that makes no sense. We should be punished for them. So I don't, I don't accept that somebody has to come and redeem us from that. So then, of course, 26 says, yeah, you, you, know, you say it's Christ coming. I don't, I don't believe that Christ is coming. And thus ye lead away this people after the foolish traditions of your fathers, and according to your own desires, and ye keep them down, even as it were in bondage, that ye may glut yourselves with the labors of their hands, that they durst not look up with boldness, and that they durst not enjoy their rights and privileges. Yea, they durst not make use of that which is their own, lest they should offend their priests, who do yoke them according to their desires, and have brought them to believe by their traditions and their dreams and their whims and their visions and their pretended mysteries that they should, if they did not do according to their words, offend some unknown being who they say is God, a being who never has been seen or known, who never was nor ever will be. His, his, his wrap-up here is he's speaking to the, the chief judge, all right, saying that uh, it's all about foolish traditions, and, and it's, it's just, you know, you, you guys are trying to control these people, and so you give them this kind of belief where they have to behave a certain way or else, or else you're going to get mad at them or else uh, you know, some, some, something bad is going to happen to them. And it's, uh, you know, as you see, it says traditions, dreams, whims, and pretended things. And uh, probably wrapping up, it says, some unknown being who, who they say is God, who, who really, no one's ever seen God and no one's ever going to see him, is what he's saying. So therefore, you know, what, what, why are you doing this, this to these people? Because you're just leading them down this path of, uh, of fantasy and it doesn't have any basis in reality. Now when the high priest and the chief judge saw the hardness of his heart, yea, when they saw that he would revile even against God, they would not make any reply to his words, but they caused that he should be bound, and they delivered him up into the hands of the officers, and sent him to the land of Zarahemla, that he might be brought before Alma, and the chief judge who was governor over all the land. And it came to pass that when he was brought before Alma and the chief judge, he did go on in the same manner as he did in the land of Gideon, yea, he went on to blaspheme. And he did rise up in great swelling words before Alma, and did revile against the priests and teachers, accusing them of leading away the people after the silly traditions of their fathers, for the sake of glutting on the labors of the people. Now it says when the, the high priests and the chief judges, they were listening, and they saw the hardness of his heart, right, that they, they didn't make any reply to, uh, to what he was saying. It, it mentions the hardness of the heart there, and so where the hardness of heart, there's no openness to hearing anything else. So right, it would be a waste of time, and seeing how how negative uh, this guy was, even as I said, they were reviling against God. So whatever you say, there would be some kind of a, a negative response coming right back, right? And uh, as, it, as we said earlier, the this is a, it's a faith-based uh, belief that we have, and uh, it does require some faith in God to to believe in the things that we do. And so a lot of the things that we believe, you, you can't prove them. It's really, it requires a faith. So somebody questioning that or not accepting that faith or you know wanting to speak against uh, against God, right? You're not going to get anywhere trying to respond. So they just said, forget this guy. Let's let, let's send him off to to Alma and let him uh, let him deal with him. Okay, so that's what they what they did. And uh, so it says as he came up to before Alma in verse 30 and then 31, right? He, he was in no no better spirits at that point than he had been earlier and kind of talked the same way. So he was not impressed with the, when before the, uh, the high priest over the whole, the whole land, and uh, 
just continued along the same the same way. He says, accusing uh, of leading with people, silly traditions, and so forth. And so he just kind of went on the same the same way. Okay. Now Alma said unto him. Thou knowest that we do not glut ourselves upon the labors of this people? For behold, I have labored even from the commencement of the reign of the judges until now with mine own hands for my support, notwithstanding my many travels round about the land to declare the word of God unto my people, and notwithstanding the many labors which I have performed in the church, I have never received so much as even one senine from my labor. Neither has any of my brethren, save it were in the judgment seat, and then we have received only according to law for our time." And now, if we do not receive anything for our labors in the church, what doth it profit us to labor in the church, save it were to declare the truth, that we may have rejoicings in the joy of our brethren? Now, at the end of the, the prior verse there, of 31, he kind of threw up the thing of, that uh, you're doing all this, as he puts it, for the sake of glutting on the labors of the people, basically uh, yeah, taking money from them and you know, the, 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 taking advantage of them in a way that, they, right, that, that they're... You know, perhaps people getting wealthy off the labors of the other people. It's, as you can see, then Alma's response to this, all right, he says, well, you know, what are you talking about? You don't know, you don't know what you're talking about with this. See, all the rest of it was a, a, a faith-based argument or a belief-type argument, saying, you know, so it's one thing to say, well, I, I don't believe this is going to happen in the future, and, and you can't prove otherwise. But now he's making a fact-based statement, saying, you know, you were all taking the money and getting rich off the people. He said, no, we are not. No, we're, no, we're not. And uh, as, as you can see, it says, I've, I've labored from the start of the reign of the judges until now. I worked for myself. I didn't take anything from, from the people. It says, I, I didn't even take one, one senide for my labor. Okay, so I labored with my own hands. I've not taken anything. And, and, I, and I've gone around and been active for the church. It's not like I'm sitting back doing nothing. I'm traveling all around the place, you know, evangelizing and teaching and so forth. And yet, I've taken no money for what, what I've done. So I've, I've done it just because this is what I feel to, to do. And, uh, and the same for those who work, work with me. They, they didn't take any money either. And now, he said, it, it, except it were in the judgment seat, it was an actual job for which uh, there was a certain salary prescribed for that job. So then it, it would make sense that, that he would get paid for that because that was, or whoever was in that position because that was a paid position. So, but see, he's trying to be totally up front here, say, all right, that, that the only money that I ever received or my brethren was when we were the, the chief judge, right? And then we just took how much was we were supposed to get. And that's what he says. And then we have received only according to law for our time. So whatever was laid out as this was the amount of funds we were supposed to get, that's what, what we got, right? And so that being all the case, right, that we've never taken any money for what we've done uh, with, with the church or regarding our beliefs, what do we have to, to gain by telling people that this belief other than the fact that we think it's true? Right, so it's not that if, if I can convince all these people that I'm right, that I'm, I'm going to get rich, they're not giving me any money. So, uh, so why would I even do it? Right? I mean, I'm just wasting my, my time if it's if it's a lie and if I don't really believe that it's true. Right? So, it's, it's a, so actually, that that part is a very compelling case. Then why sayest thou that we preach unto this people to get gain, when thou of thyself knowest that we receive no gain? And now believest thou that we deceive this people that causes such joy in their hearts? And Korihor answered him, Yea. And then Alma said unto him, Believest thou that, that there is a God? And he answered, Nay. Now Alma said unto him, Will ye deny again that there is a God, and also deny the Christ? For behold, I say unto you, I know there is a God, and also that Christ shall come. As he's uh, ending this particular part of the argument, right? So he's saying, so you see uh, that obviously we're not getting rich off these people. So there's no reason for us in that uh, area to speak the way we are. So being that's the case, do you, do you think we're deceiving the people by saying what we're saying? But how do they as hard as a party? He says, yeah, I, I, I still think that, right? And uh, did you believe there's a God? No, I don't believe there's a God. You know, for that matter, we could ask somebody the same thing today, right? If we were gonna have a discussion uh, about the, the church, let's say, and the person said they didn't believe in God, well then it's be kind of hard to have that kind of conversation. Right? Because you can't pull out the scripture and say, well, let me show you what it says in the scripture. So I, I don't believe in that either. Right? So you would re really wouldn't get very far at all. So it's just, just you know, I mean, in our case, doesn't mean that you give up. It just means you understand what you can say and not say. So, so if it, at least a belief in God, well, then, all right, well, you start with that, and then you build on that. If there's no belief in God, then you're in a totally different place. And so that's, uh, so that's where, where he's at now, right? He hears him basically deny that there's a God. And this is basically saying, are you, are you sure that that's what you're trying to say here? I just want to understand that this is what, what your belief is, or are we going further in this conversation? 
And now what evidence have ye that there is no God, or that Christ cometh not? I say unto you that ye have none, save it be your word only. But behold, I have all things as a testimony that these things are true. And ye also have all things as a testimony unto you that they are true. And will ye deny them? Believest thou that these things are true? Behold, I know that thou believest, but thou art possessed with a lying spirit. And ye have put off the Spirit of God, that it may have no place in you. But the devil has power over you, and he doth carry you about, working devices that he may destroy the children of God. Alma's using a little different type of uh, an approach uh, here. A lot of times we're put on the defensive when somebody says, you know, prove what, what you believe. So he's turning around and he says, well, you, you prove what you believe, right? You, you know, prove to me that there's, no, that, there's, that there's no God. Prove to me that Christ is not coming. And uh, it says, but, but we just heard, there's really no way to prove that either. So it, and he's using the same type of an argument than saying, well, it's, it's just your word. So, you know, you're, you're saying this is my word. I say it's just your word. So really, we're, we're at a standstill, or we're at an impasse here, because because <clears throat> either one of us can say what we think is, is right, but yet, you know, it can't be proven, certainly until the time comes that Christ would come, or, or not come. In 42, now you turn around on him and saying, but you know what, you, you do really do believe in, in God, even though you're, you're lying and saying that you don't. You're just being used by the devil at this point. So, so Alma had that insight, and remember, Alma is a prophet of God. I don't know if he knew him in particular, but he knew what kind of spirit he was carrying. He said, you're carrying the spirit of the devil right now. You're letting the devil use you in an argumentative way to try to undermine people's faith. But uh, really, he says, I, I think you really do believe in God. You're just saying that you don't for the sake of the argument. And now Cory Horse said unto Alma, If thou wilt show me a sign that I may be convinced that there is a God, yea, show unto me that he hath power and then will I be convinced of the truth of thy words. But Alma said unto him, Thou hast had signs enough. Will ye tempt your God? Will ye say, Show unto me a sign, when ye have the testimony of all these thy brethren, and also all the holy prophets? The scriptures are laid before thee, yea, and all things denote there is a God. Yea, even the earth, and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, and its motion, yea, and also all the planets which move in their regular form, do witness that there is a supreme creator. And yet do ye go about leading away the hearts of this people, testifying unto them there is no God? And yet will ye deny against all these witnesses? And he said, Yea, I will deny, except ye shall show me a sign. So what's uh, what does Corey Horse say that he wants now? A sign, a sign okay. And so it says, uh, show, you know, show me a sign, and then I'll be convinced that there, that there's a God. So why would he, would he not be given a sign? You wouldn't believe, no matter what, no matter what it was, all right. That, uh, it, yeah, that someone who says, "Well, show me a sign," or someone who doesn't obviously have faith, and, and they're trying to tempt the person or whatever, and uh, yeah, it's, it's not really going to make any difference. So that's why there's no reason to, to give a, a sign in that way. Uh, Alma said, "You you already had signs, right? There's signs in, in all over the, the place that God exists." seen the things that the, the prophets have talked about. You see the things of the earth and the things that God does with the earth and the, and the planets and so forth. So we, there's all these things right in front of your eyes. So to say, well, show me, show me one, one more sign and I'll believe is really not, not going to be accurate because you, know, you see everything already and you say you don't believe. Well, a sign is not going to change your, uh, change your mind there. And now it came to pass that Alma said unto him, Behold, I am grieved because of the hardness of your heart. Yea, that ye will resist the spirit of the truth, that thy soul may be destroyed. But behold, it is better that thy soul should be lost, than that thou shouldst be the means of bringing many souls down to destruction, by thy lying and by thy flattering words. Therefore, if thou shalt deny again, behold, God shall smite thee, that thou shalt become dumb, and thou shalt never open thy mouth any more, that thou shalt not deceive this people any more. Now Cory Horse said unto him, I do not deny the existence of a God, but I do not believe that there is a God, and I say also that ye do not know that there is a God, and except ye show me a sign, I will not believe. So Alma's getting to the point where you know, he's had enough at this point, all right? So as you see in 46, it says, I'm grieved because of the hardness of your heart, all right? And uh, that you're speaking this way that at risk of your eternal soul, right? That your soul would not be destroyed by denying the existence of God, all right? But yet now in 47, it's saying, but the, still, even though it hurts me to say this, it's better for your soul to be lost than for you to make others lose their souls. So if, if you're going to insist on not believing that something has to be done with you, that, that you won't affect other people this way. 
And so that's why he says that if, if you deny again, God's going to smite you and, and cause that you can't talk anymore. He says you'll become dumb, that you'll never open your mouth anymore, that you won't deceive the people anymore. So that's so he's telling him exactly what's what's going to happen. Now, I don't know about you, but if, you're, if, you, if this is like a prophet of God who's telling uh, me this, you, know, you have to please to think about this. Wait a minute, now, all right? And the, I, I really want this to happen, okay? So, but he's, he's telling him exactly. So it's not like it just out of the blue, you know, came and uh, he was smitten just like that. He was he was warned. He says, yeah, basically, say it one more time, and, and uh, this is what's what's going to happen, okay? So. Now, now his response in 48, I mean, I know, to me it almost sounds like a little bit of double talk here. Right? He says, I, I, I don't deny the existence of a God, but, but I don't believe there's a God. I guess he's saying that no one can really know that there's a God. So therefore, yeah, there might be one, but I, I, I'm choosing not to believe. And, and there's nothing that you can say that's going to change that unless you show me a sign. Now Alma said unto him, This will I give unto thee for a sign, that thou shalt be struck dumb according to my words, and I say that in the name of God ye shall be struck dumb, that ye shall no more have utterance. Now when Alma had said these words, Corihu was struck dumb, that he could not have utterance, according to the words of Alma. And now when the chief judge saw this, he put forth his hand and wrote unto Corihu, saying, Art thou convinced of the power of God? In whom did ye desire that Alma should show forth his sign? Would ye that he should afflict others to show unto thee a sign? Behold, he has showed unto you a sign, and now will ye dispute more? Alma was using the uh, the request of Corihor for a sign to say, well, God's dealing with you will, will be your sign then, all right? You're asking for something special, something over and above what's already in the scripture and what's already known in the world. Well, this is going to be your sign that God's going to do this to you, and you're not going to like it, but it's, it's, going to, it's what's going to happen. And, and this will prove to you there's a God because now just in my word, you're, you're going to be struck dumb just like that. And so, and sure enough, that's, that's, that's what happened. It says, in the name of God, shall be struck down, they shall have no more utterance. And as soon as he said that, it happened exactly as, as he said, right? That he couldn't talk. And then suddenly, you know, imagine the, the, uh, the scariness of that, right? Or the fright of that here, you know, somebody who especially is, uh, sounded like a, a flattering type of a talker. So he basically made his, his living uh, by talking. And so now, suddenly, he's not able to anymore. So it's, mouth wouldn't work and they couldn't give any utterance and, and nothing to say. All right now, so, so, so now the, the, the chief judge is, is going to put out there what uh, what happened. It says, now are you convinced right, that, that you asked for a sign and yet you insisted that Alma would show you a sign and, and this is what now this is what's happened. All right? So are you satisfied with this and uh, are you convinced now or do you still have an argument that, uh, that God doesn't exist after Alma just said the words and you wouldn't be able to talk, and now you can't talk, just like he said. So now you, now you have your sign. So now, now what do you have to say for yourself? And Corihor put forth his hand and wrote, saying, I know that I am dumb, for I cannot speak. And I know that nothing save it were the power of God could bring this upon me. Yea, and I also knew that there was a God. But behold, the devil hath deceived me, for he appeared unto me in the form of an angel, and said unto me, Go and reclaim this people, for they have all gone astray after an unknown God. And he said unto me, There is no God. Yea, and he taught me that which I should say, and I have taught his words, and I taught them because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind, and I taught them even until I had much success, insomuch that I verily believed that they were true, and for this cause I withstood the truth, even until I have brought this great curse upon me. Corey Hoare responds through writing, right, and, and now you see the, what, what really happened. Right? This is kind of a revealing of what really happened. That everything else was kind of... Uh, a front and uh, presenting uh, an argument in a certain way, right? But, but now you see, he says, I, I, I understand that this was the power of God because nothing but the power of God could have made this happen. And says, the, the, the devil deceived me, right? Says, the devil came to me and spoke to me. As it said right there, he appeared in the form of an angel and told me all these things, told me that there, there's no God, told me that the people are being led astray, told me that all the things that I should go tell them. So it says it's the, the devil appearing as an angel taught him these things, and so he was carrying forth that, that message, message from the devil. He, he taught the words to say, he says he, uh, he practiced them you know, until he, he had it down, down pat, and so he had a really convincing message, and the message was so convincing that he convinced who? He convinced himself, right? He convinced himself that, that, that it was true, even though he at first didn't, didn't believe that way, but the, the argument was so compelling that he convinced himself it was true, and that, that made it, I'll say, even easier to then 
deliver that argument to other people because he believed that that was true and that, there, that the people were being led astray and fooled by Alma and so forth and that he needed to deliver this message. And so then he said, now that I've done that, now, as it said at the end, I withstood the truth even until I brought this great curse upon me. So really it's because I, I was deceived by the devil that all this has happened to me now. So really it's a, it's a great testimony, right? <laughs> because now he's recognizing really what, what happened and the, the, the enemy did this and God did this. Now when he had said this, he besought that Alma should pray unto God that the curse might be taken from him. But Alma said unto him, If this curse should be taken from thee, thou wouldst again lead away the hearts of this people. Therefore it shall be unto thee, even as the Lord will. And it came to pass that the curse was not taken off of Korihor, but he was cast out, and went about from house to house begging for his food. Now that he's made this uh, confession, and uh, acknowledged that it was the devil that, that fooled him, and that he really does believe in God, well, so now he asks Alma, hey, Alma, how about you pray to God if this goes away now? And Alma said, I, I'm not going to do that. If I pray for this to be reversed, and you, you get your, your voice back, yeah, you're, you're just going to go back to what you were doing anyway. Because you, this is who you are. God has, has done this to you to prevent you from leading the people astray. So why would I tell him to, to change that? Why would I tell him to, to give you back the tool that you would use to lead people astray? It says at the end of verse 55, you know, therefore it shall be unto thee even as the Lord will. Right? So that uh, if you have an argument, you have the argument with God, not, not with me. Sixth, it says it came to pass the curse was not taken off of Cory Horus, so he, he was sent out and had to go around begging for food because now he no longer had the, the capability to um, perhaps make a living in whatever way he did before because now he can't even talk. So it'd be kind of hard to, for somebody who was a talker, to be able to, to earn, uh, earn a living without being able to talk. So now he's had to become a beggar to beg for his food. Now the knowledge of what had happened unto Cory Hor was immediately published throughout all the land. Yea, the proclamation was sent forth by the chief judge to all the people in the land, declaring unto those who had believed in the words of Cory Hor that they must speedily repent, lest the same judgments would come upon them. And it came to pass that they were all convinced of the wickedness of Cory Hor, therefore they were all converted again unto the Lord. And this put an end to the iniquity after the manner of Cory Hor. And Cory Hor did, did go about from house to house, begging food for his support that they sent forth word throughout the land of, of what had happened, right? And, uh, and they did that for, for a reason. And they did that, as it says right there, that they did it so that the people would understand that he was wrong. Because a lot of the people were affected by his words, and a lot of them were deceived by what he was saying. So they let everybody know he, he's already, he's confessed that the, that the devil told him to do this, and God's judgment upon him was that now he's been struck dumb, that he can't talk. So is that, is that the guy whose side you want to be on? Is that who, who you want to be following? Or do you want to follow the, the true and living God? Do you want to follow what, what the words of Alma have been? So they made sure that everybody knew what had happened. This way they, they, they could make the proper choice. It says in the 58, it says, Therefore they were all converted again unto the Lord. And then this put an end to the iniquity after the manner of, of Cory Moore. That, that, that was the right thing to do. Let people know this is what happened. This way they can make the right choice. And it came to pass that as he went forth among the people, yea, among the people who had separated themselves from the Nephites and called themselves Zoramites, being led by a man whose name was Zoram, and as he went forth amongst them, behold, he was run upon and trodden down, even until he was dead. And thus we see the end of him who perverted the ways of the Lord, and thus we see that the devil will not support his children at the last day, but doth speedily drag them down to hell. Following up at the end of the eight, it said, had repeated the court where he went from house to house begging food for support. So this came to pass that now he went forth among this other group of people called the, the, the Zoramites, right, being led by a man named Zoram. And it, as he went, uh, I guess, begging or for, the, for food with among those people, says they, they ran him over somehow, right? says he was, uh, he was run, run upon and trodden down even until he was dead, right? So that. Uh, now again, I mean, how that actually happened is, is unclear, but you know, the, the, basically he, he died, and right? he died while he was begging for, for food. I mean, maybe he was on the ground, and they just walked over him, and maybe they had on the chariots or something, or horses, or who knows. Anyway, he, he says he was trodden down and, until he was dead. The point being, as it says in 60, that uh, now you see where you, where you go when you join the devil's team, right? It says that, uh, 
as you, we see the end of him reverse the way the Lord devil will not support his children in the last day and just lets them, whatever happened, happen. It says that he'll speedily drag them down to hell because certainly the soon, if you're in that position, the sooner you die, the sooner you're on, you're on your way. And so it says the devil just uh, was not being supportive of his servant, but just let, let him die as a, a dumb beggar being trodden down in the street until he was dead.